on her brain. Uh, they've tested it's not lymphoma. Um, they've, uh, through testing, found that there are, are other spots. And on Wednesday, they're planning to do a biopsy. There's some thought that maybe cancer or an infection, possibly. So, not just sure. They get that all right. Anything else? Okay. And uh, also, Clarice's um, dad, uh, they found an aneurysm on his stomach, and uh, there's a concern there. She's going to be uh, cons uh, pursuing consultation and getting more facts on that about her dad, Neo. You know, so, just keep him in prayer for all her other prayer requests. Glad to see some of you back after some surgery and some sickness and so forth. We'll be together again. I'm glad you're coming along. If there's nothing else, why don't we uh, bow in prayer? Lord, we want to thank you today for your goodness upon us. Your grace continues to flow. Your promises are faithful and true because you are a God of love. And you are a God of power that can carry through on your promises. You are a God of all wisdom and knowledge. You are eternal. So nothing takes you by surprise. There are no tricks that can trip you up. And we rejoice today in God our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, and the indwelling Holy Spirit, the Father God in heaven that reigns upon the throne. Lord, you are the Almighty, O God. Thank you that we can slow down with everything that we have on our to-do list. We can slow down and in obedience to your word. We don't forsake the assembly of ourselves together, but we come together to edify and to build each other up. We have enjoyed singing together this morning. We thank you for music. We thank you for instruments and, and vocal singing, for truth of words based upon your your Bible, your, your word, Lord, the Bible, that we can sing these things and know that we're not just leaning on something that's going to be like a, a staff that's going to stick us in the hand, as the Bible says that we can lean on, lean on your word and find it faithful. We're thankful that we can be confident of this very thing that you, that you've done a good work in us, and we'll continue it until the day of Jesus Christ when you come. When we hear that trumpet sound, we're caught up to be with you for eternity. And as we sang earlier, the celestial city, the married and beautiful, we're looking forward to that heavenly city. We rejoice that you are God. You have provided this, not because we deserve it in any way, but for your great love's sake, for your great sacrifice. As you came, you became the God man, and took on bodily form, a body that could bear our sins. Because you were sinless, that you could die in our place. You so loved the world that you gave your only begotten Son. That whoever will believe in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. We thank you. Lord, we, we pray for the courier family. Passing of Joyce and Dan, now Ron, funeral this last week. Pray that you'll comfort the family, encourage them as they're very burdened and brokenhearted, strengthen and care for them. Be with Jerry Decker and help as I pass the pew bring the service today. As I seek to minister, guide my words, and may uh, your spirit be at work there this afternoon. The people will be drawn to you, have a passion for you. Committed to you because of the testimony of this godly woman that, that did what she could. Just pray that you will also be with Stephanie this week with the seizures that she's having and help them be able to stop these and deal with them because of the damage to her body and uh, Lord, these spots on the brain and elsewhere in her body. Lord, we would be delighted if something simple that is just an infection, something can be, can be rid. We would pray for her strength for her physically and spiritually, mentally, and emotionally. Just help Stephanie and this time and her family. And, uh, give them grace for the journey as it's uh, been a lot of problems along the way. Just uh, use us for your glory, we pray. Be with Clarice and her family who are struggling with their dad with his stomach aneurysm and uh, making decisions about that to leave it or to do something. Um, it's, a, it's a great concern. We pray for comfort for the family. And you have others that have loved ones that are facing a hard time. When we think of Mary's brother Bird who's going for her surgery for Betty Chairs, thank you that she's still coughing some, but she's getting over the pneumonia. We thank you for our servicemen that are here today. We thank you for those that have served over the years. That you have blessed America. Please continue to meet each of you, we pray. So here we are. As uh, the seconds and the minutes tick by in the service of our lives, thank you that you are the God.
God who is beyond time. And you've got to prepare a place for us. We can be together here today in obedience to your word. We bless those that are preparing for baptism in just a couple of weeks that uh, they will be able to come and share and give them the courage, the boldness that they need to comfort the words to say. And may you work with their loved ones that will be here to hear their testimony. And if they're obeying you by being baptized, testifying of what's already happened inside. Be blessed and help our church to be growing, meet our financial need, meet our need for workers, help us to do well, or meet the need of teachers to study and prepare week by week, and others that are doing different things. Lord, you're blessing us in mighty ways in these days. We're so thankful. May you ever get the glory. Help us be humble, help us be faithful, help us be servant hearted, help us be faithful to your word, help us to keep the Christian armor on to do battle. Serve a heart like you. In Jesus' name. We bless our time in the Word. Amen. Let's turn to the Scriptures. Do you have your Bible right here? Thank you, Nicole. Galatians chapter 4.
now it seems that some of these churches or individuals or groups are talking about turning away and going back into Judaism and into the works of the law. And so he says he's afraid for them, lest I have labored for you in vain. And he says in verse 12, Brethren, I urge you to become like me. There it is. He's urging them that, uh, well, that's our next point. I wanted to talk some more, not just about the mimicking, but about being a parent. Are you a caring parent? He's like a parent here that's bringing children into the world. How caring are you? How caring are you to your children, grandchildren, neighbor kids? Paul saying, I care about you. Do you care for anybody today? Do you care for your family members, your neighbors, your coworkers? Are you like a caring parent? That you're willing to sometimes say the hard things to people because you love them that much? To say the hard things? If, you don't, if parents don't care, they just let the kids run wild. Eh, wild and black. But caring parents that care, they, they, they say the hard things. They get in the child's face sometimes. They, they, they get their attention. They sit them down and talk to them. They say some no's. They say some yeses. They say some go do this. They say, don't go do that. And this is the rule. Why? Because a parent cares. A grandparent cares. And we set some standards of, of yes and no, and right and wrong. Is that our job? Is that because we care? That's kind of the, the demeanor here that Paul's talking about. He's reaching out to them. He says, I, I labor for you. Why? Because he cared for them. It's important that we tell people that we care for them. It's important we say that we love you. It's important to say we're praying for you if we are right. It's important to be there for each other. I labor as a parent because I'm concerned for you. I care for you. And as children, as teens, it's important that the children respond in that manner. If you had a parent that cared for you and said no sometimes, you have a lot to be thankful for. But if you were born into a home that you didn't have the parents that you had, Maybe you didn't have any parents, or maybe one parent, or, or parents that didn't care, or parents that didn't tell you anything, or parents say, well, you do what you want, or you make up your standards, or maybe they were a poor example to you in some ways. Of course, none of us are perfect, we're all poor examples to some degree, but parents that are just flagrantly uh, illegal or, or, or wicked against the things of God. Oh, let us be a parent like Paul was a parent to these Galatian churches that cared. Let us be that that spiritual parent to one another to care for each other. And we can, we can support one another here. Do you care for each other here? Does Heritage Baptist Church care for each other within the body? Uh, we had a great time last night at, at uh, family game night. Just, just a tremendous time. And if you stayed home because you were tired, um, well, you missed out. I was joking with them earlier. So now I'm going to give them to them from the pulpit. <laughs> right? Yeah. You know, because we're family. And, and, and there's other ways. We just fellowship. Yeah, amen. And, uh, it's great being the body. Because we need each other. You know, fellowship's important. How, how do you parent if you're not with your kids? How do you, how do you care for one another and say, I care for you? You don't spend any time together. And that's, that's why it's good to get together with the family of God. You know, at some point it's great, but there's other opportunities too. Get together and go, go out for lunch or something, go out for supper, or uh, you know, come to family by hour early, or come to prayer meeting, or you know, there's team, team class. There's an opportunity that we visit after, sit around, stand around and talk. And uh, you know it's good, we just don't rush in and rush out. Oh, we need to care as a parent, as a family, we need to care for each other. Oh, that's my passion. Are you getting my passion today? Are you getting Paul's passion? We need to be family. We need to care for each other. To be a parent. Maybe you can come alongside a brother or a sister and be, uh, you can call them a brother or a sister, but maybe you can be a spiritual parent in some ways. Just kind of to disciple them along, to encourage them along. Do you care? Paul says, I urge you to come like me, says, I lay, I'm afraid for I, let me read verse 11. I am afraid for you, lest I have labored for you in vain. Brother, I urge you to come like me. A caring parent and also. Uh, an example to mimic, an example to follow. Brother, I urge you to become like me. Can you say that? Can you say that to people? I want you to live like I'm living. Are you living in such
such a manner as that you could set yourself up as an example. Because I'm telling you that each of us are an example. Each of us are an influence. What if everybody lived just like you? What if everyone served uh, in evangelism just like you? What if each person served in building grounds type responsibilities just like you? What if everyone um, uh, was a teacher just like you? Or what if everybody prayed just like you? How would God's work be? Oh, let us stand up. Let us be the Paul and to be an example for someone to mimic. Follow my example. What if everybody talked like you and used that language like at work or out the guys? What if everybody looked at the things that you looked at or, or went to places you went and, and acted the way you acted? What if, what if they were? Can you say that? Mimic me? And that's a hard thing to say. Oh, my goodness. God knows my weaknesses, right? And I know my weaknesses, and people around me know my weaknesses, right? That's a hard thing to say, but yet, by the Spirit of God, by obedience to Christ, to have the, the fruit of the Spirit that's coming up in the uh, next chapter, where you over here in Galatians, we can say, mimic me as we walk in the Spirit, as we yield to the Spirit, follow me. Paul said that. Let's turn back to 1 Corinthians 9. 1 Corinthians 9. First Corinthians 9 and verse 19 through 22 says, For though I am free from all men, I have made myself a servant to all, that I might win the more. Here's Paul's attitude back in First Corinthians. He says, I'm free from all men, but you know what? I made myself a servant that I might win the more. Verse 20. And to the Jews, I became as a Jew, that I might win Jews. To those who are under the law, as those who, as under the law, that I might win those who are under the law. Verse 21, to those who are without law, as without law, not being without law toward God, but under the law toward Christ. He says, you know, the, the, the Gentiles, those out there just, just with them. Not that I didn't have any rules or standards. He says, I'm happy with them, that I might win them. Being an influence. Verse 22, to the weak I became this weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. That's the idea there. They make me follow me. I care for you. I, I love you in the Lord. I praise the Lord. We have a close church family here. Let's keep uh, fostering that. Thank you, Joe, for being over fellowship committee and uh, ministering these fellowships, bringing the devotional, set this all up. You know, it's a lot of work to set up for these things. And uh, make it happen, organize it, plan it, present it. Praise the Lord for people who will do that. But let's love each other. That's, that's just one position. We all need each other in the body of Christ. Let's mimic each other in the good things. Let's follow Christ as our example. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 11, 1, Imitate me just as I also imitate Christ. Amen? As we imitate Christ. He wasn't perfect in every way. Paul wasn't. But he says, as I follow Christ, follow me, mimic me. Be like Paul, a ministering father. Nothing can separate us. Verse 12, there, Galatians 4, 12. Here's his attitude. For I became like you. You have not injured me at all. In verse 12. You have not injured me at all. He says, he says you might be doing some things wrong and and um, so forth, but I'm like a father. You know what? We're going to stick this out. We're going to hang in there. You know what your marriage is? Guys, you need to hang in there in your marriage. Ladies, you need to hang in there in your marriage. Is it always easy? No. Is your spouse perfect? No. Are you perfect? No. Am I perfect? No. Right? And uh, we hang in there. We keep after it. In our brother sister relationships, we hang in there. Yes, we do. We work things out. And Paul's like a father. He says, nothing's going to separate us. We're, we're going to keep on going together here. Are you like a, a father in that sense? Are you willing to work together with the brother? So how are you doing in these things? Are you as a parent that cares? Are you an example to many? Or are you a ministering father? Notice how he, he uh, described it in 1 Thessalonians 2. He says, but we were gentle among you, just as a nursing mother cherishes her own children. Here's mother, but father's kind of the same idea over here in Galatians. So affectionately longing for you, we were well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives, because you have become 
13. You know that because of physical infirmity, I preached the gospel to you at the first. He says, even though I had physical problems, maybe he couldn't travel to the next city. Maybe he couldn't go where he wanted to go because of a physical infirmity. It held back the gospel work. But in the midst of the gospel work being held back because of a physical infirmity, guess what? The Galatian churches were the recipients of God's work right there. God used him right where he was at. You know, he didn't get off the mission field to the end of the Right there. Is that what he says? And so he, he's ministering. Because of his physical infirmity, I preached to you the gospel at the first. He says, you were there and I shared it with you. You got the gospel first. I was on my way, but God slowed me down, stopped me, and there we were, I shared the gospel, and you were saved, and the church was established. Amen? As a father, he's caring for them. I minister to you the gospel, and there's service with the Lord, folks, that you and I have, have traveled, the end of the years to be four years, that we have traveled together as pastors and, and brothers and sisters, and you guys, before I came, and some since I came, but you know what? We are deepening a relationship that's going to last the rest of our lives, and into eternity. Someday. We're close here. We're feeling it. We're sticking out. That's Paul saying here. I ministered to the gospel, sweet serving together. Verse 14, we work together, it says here, in my trial, which was in my flesh. Still talking about this infirmity, right? Seems. Which was my flesh, you did not despise nor reject. But you receive me as an angel of God, even as Christ Jesus. He says, I got this physical problem. And uh, you, you didn't look down and say, boy, this small guy, he's, you know, he's coughing or he's, he's uh, laying with one leg or he can't see. And I'm just, I don't want to hear his mess. No, they received him. They received him as an angel. And they, they were close to him. He received him even as uh, the Lord himself. As even as Christ Jesus they received Paul. He's commending them here. He's reaching out and thanking them. They have a closeness. And last week you folks reached out to me and reached out to Tracy and made this big poster. And I got it over home there. And Tracy keeps moving around. She says, take that to church. And I'm saying, I'm looking at this thing. And I'm looking at all these hands of these kids that were cut out. That, that's amazing. And the kids got up and sang. And, and Tracy and I sitting over here. And the deacons come up. Thank you, man. And, and uh, an abundant financial gift and gift cards and, and uh, folks sent us cards in the mail and, and cards as part of that minister to us, thank you and so pastor appreciation thank you so much what a blessing, and that's what Paul's saying here you know, with, with all the ailments and still you were, you were loving on me you received me as an angel of God even as Christ Jesus, wow and so he's complimenting and enjoying serving I'm enjoying serving the Lord with you folks. I'm blessed. Praise the Lord. And we work together. And so Paul's loving here. You folks are loving on me and we're loving on each other. And so the blessings, if you enjoy verse 15, he says, What then was the blessing you enjoy? Just think about the blessings that you had. Do you remember when you were saved? Do you remember the burden you bore before you came to Christ? Do you remember what happened when you called upon the name of the Lord? And you, you prayed and you said, oh Lord, save me and forgive me of my sins. Remember the burden that was rolled away? You know, if you were young, sometimes maybe children don't, don't feel that or sense that. But I remember at 17 years of age, I had been on both sides of the fence, playing church. And I was out there too, you know, phony. But God knew my heart. And God continued to tap me. The Holy Spirit continued to... Poke his finger into my heart and say, You need to change. You need to turn. And I was afraid that I would get deaf wandering from God. Oh, God still be calling, but the Bible talks about a hard heart, a callous heart, deaf ears that kind of just wanders away and says no to God so many times that we just wander off to eternal judgment, death, and lake of fire. So he's speaking to them here, loving on them. Do you remember the blessings you enjoyed? They didn't enjoy it because they were over in the law, but they enjoyed it because of grace through faith in Christ alone. And coming to the Savior, that's the only way they enjoyed these good things. Do you remember that, Christian? Let us, let us pour out our worship to God. Oh God, we thank you right now for the salvation we have in you because of the cross. Oh, we worship you, Lord. Amen. All the blessings that we enjoy. He's loved on me as a father. I'm not the enemy, verse 
Well, let's finish verse 15. What then was the blessing that you enjoyed? For I bear you witness that, if possible, you would have plucked out your own eyes and given them to me. So he's already talked about physical infirmity, trial in the flesh, and now he's talking about them plucking out their eyes. It's believed and probable, I would think, that Paul had eye problems. And I struggled with that. He says, you have plucked out your eyes and given them to me. Wow. Would you give up your eye for someone? Your eyes? They wanted, they wanted to get behind the work of Paul. They wanted Paul to go plant more churches. They loved Paul. What a blessing. Word of Paul. What a blessing we had from God. We can bless others because God has blessed us. Verse 16 says, Have I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? Am I your enemy? Because I'm telling you the truth? You know, parents, we've got to tell our kids the truth. You know, I hate it when parents tell me, ready for this? I'll let my kids decide about the church. You invite them to church, you want to bring your kids to church and get them to BBS or something, I'll let my kids when they get old enough, I'll let them decide. Well, let me tell you right now what they're going to decide. They're going to decide to go with the flesh because that's what they have the habit of doing with the old man and the pleasures of this world. And if the parents don't set any better example, they let the kids choose. What do we all choose? Whatever comes natural. What comes natural is the flesh. The spiritual things are not natural because we don't like to say that we're wrong. We don't want to admit that we're sinners. We don't want to change and follow the right way. We want to do what feels good. We want to do what tastes good. We want to do what looks good and pleasurable to us. We want to do those are the way children will go out of that. You've got to say no. We've got to fight against the things of the flesh and say, you know what, there's a God in heaven. There's a Savior, Lord Jesus Christ, and I need to look to. And I need to be a disciple of and follow him. Not just a fair way back there some sometime that I forgot about. Yeah, back. When I was two, I prayed, and I still live like the devil. That's not what salvation is. Salvation is that we did receive Christ at some point, and now we're continuing daily to be a disciple. Amen? We're following Him. It's obedience is what it is. And so then we've got to tell them the, the truth like Paul's been pounding on them here. You, we, we've been working through his messages, chapters 3 and 4 here. And it's been hard. He's been laying it right out. Parents, are you willing to say the hard things to your kids? Are you willing to hold them accountable and say, that's wrong, don't touch it, and if you do, you get your hands smacked, or you get a spanking, or you're going to sit in the chair, you get off the chair, that there will be self, teach them some self-control. And if there's right, and if there's wrong, and if there's a God, they're going to be accountable to. If we, as parents, do not hold our children accountable, and they rebel against parental authority, and they're not held accountable, and they rebel against the school authority of the teachers, they rebel against the principal, they rebel against the police, they rebel against the, the, the other people that are authorities, they rebel against the government. Ultimately, they are going to rebel against the authority of God because God has ordained them. Mom and dad's authority, the, the police, the school teacher, the, the workers, the law of the land, the government, and also the God. They're going to have to get account to it. And our job is to say the hard things and hold them accountable and sometimes let them step in where it's deep and you told them not to let them sink a little bit and save them the last second, so to speak. But to our man soweth, he shall also reap, right? And let them understand that from an early age. You can't get away with things if there's accountability. And so I'm not an enemy, Paul says, for telling you the truth. He goes on to talk about that zealousness in verse 17. He now warns them, verse 17. They zealously court you, but for no good. And these were some, some very strong words in the Greek, the zealously courting you. They were patient, almost like a drooling, your phone at the mouth going after them, just, just pursuing them with passion. And it wasn't going to come to any good, what they were offering. They want to exclude you for no good. Yes, they want to exclude you that you may be zealous for them. They had wrong motives. They weren't really caring about these people. Zealous according to you, but for no good. Yes, they want to exclude you that you may be zealous for them. They're saying, well, we found this over in Hebrews 13 this morning in our family Bible as well. It's the same parallel idea. Oh, you don't have a temple to go to. You don't have an altar to go to. You guys got to stay out of the temple now. You're one of those Christians. We have the temple. We have the sacrifices. Passover's coming. Are you going to be ready? And the, the, the Jews are going, well, what are we going to do about Passover? We always went up to the Passover land. They're, they're trying to push them out. They 
them that uh, their, their motives are not right. We've got to warn our kids of false desire here, verses 19 and 20. This is what our desire is for our children. My little children for whom I labor in birth again until Christ is formed in you. He says, are you going to put me through childbirth again? Do I got to go back and you to the Lord? Are you really not saved? Are you going to wander away from God and become the mission field again? Because we are either a missionary or we're the mission field. Did we hear that before? We're a missionary or a mission field. Are you a missionary? If you're not being a missionary in the gospel, then, then we're a mission field. So needs to work with us to get us going to be a missionary. Because we're the ambassadors for Christ. And so his desire here was that he didn't have to bring them through childbirth again, so to speak. Then you have to come back and share the gospel again and try to bring them back to the Lord, back to salvation. Maybe they were never saved before. Because Christ is formed in them. That's where we're going. We're going to be more like Christ. Until Christ is formed in you. Verse 20. I would like to be present with you now and to change my tone. For I have doubts about you. I'm not going to worry about you guys. You're not living the right way. I want to be present with you. I want to change my tone. Instead of being harsh like the other in chapter 3, he's not becoming gentle. He's not going to change my tone. I want, to, I want to work with you. You guys got to get on the right track here. That's my desire to be like Christ. We move us into the next section here. Another evidence, not just the evidence of their deep love relationship, but he's going to take what we've been talking about uh, physical things, infirmities. He's talking about laboring, verse 11. And Labor in birth, verse 19. Now he's going to talk about two ladies that did have childbirth. Sarah and Hagar. And so he moves now into a symbolic section where he takes an Old Testament story of the life of Sarah and then Hagar came along and then Ishmael was born and then Isaac was born. And he's going to uh, present this. Let's move along. God doesn't give instructions. I want to put a warning here at the beginning for us to search all the scriptures for hidden meanings. Now God takes this Old Testament truth of these ladies and their sons and uses it for a spiritual, symbolic, allegorical purpose. But uh, when the plain sense of scripture makes sense, seek no other sense. When the plain sense of scripture makes plain sense, seek no other sense. Unless there's some things that it clearly says that Jesus spoke the parable about. Then you're looking, you know it's a parable, right? And so, you know, we can get ourselves, there's a lot of false teachers out there, a lot of people that's got themselves in trouble because they're looking for some symbolism, they're looking for hidden meanings, and all this stuff, and you go, wow, how'd they get that? Wow. You know what, there's enough here we don't have to try and uh, conjure up and imagine things. So God does this, and it's laid out here in Scripture, but just kind of a warning there. Get off track if we go a hog wild these things. Notice, first of all, that historical facts, verse 21. Tell me, you who desire to be under the law, do you not hear the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondwoman, the other by a free woman. And so we're going to go into this. The symbolism here, these two sons, symbolize the law and the promise. We have here Ishmael, born by Hagar. Hagar was an Egyptian slave that Hagar had. It was the servant of Sarah. The servant of Sarah. And she was a bond woman, and she's described, verses 22 and 23, to be after the flesh. Verse 23. But he who was of the bond woman was born according to the flesh, and he of the free woman through promise. So here's the message he says. Which one are you following? Are you following the child of Hagar? Or are you following the child of Sarah, Abraham's wife? Uh, there's Isaac then, who was born of Sarah, a free woman, by promise. That's what was promised to Abraham. Now, Sarah got up in years and she goes, you know what, Abraham? Take my maid, Hagar, as your wife, and have a child by her, and that'll be our child then, because she's my slave, and so we'll have this child of promise. That wasn't the flesh. That was their plan. That wasn't God's plan. Yes, they were getting up in years, and it wasn't until Sarah was 90, and uh, was her husband Abraham was 100, that uh, they had Isaac. And so they tried to do it their way, and it caused a lot of trouble. Do you agree with that it caused a lot of trouble? Amen. 
Come, it was Abraham. Get out of your country and go to a land that I'll show you. Over in chapter 13 of Genesis, his descendants were declared to be as the dust of the ground. Remember that? Chapter 15, the covenant is reviewed, and it says that his heir would be of his own body, not his servant, which was, was Eliezer, something like that his name was. Uh, what about my servant? Just let my servant Eliezer be. No. Of your own body. It wouldn't be as the stars of the sky your descendants will be. And he believed God. In chapter 16, that's where they got the idea of having this child with Hagar, Abraham and Hagar, had Ishmael. And it was says that he would be a wild man, and that his hand would be against all men, and all men's hand would be against him. Why? Because he's a wild man, and his descendants are the Arabs. Is the light bulb coming on with anything just yet? The Arabs against the Jews or the Israelites? Okay. So that's in chapter 13 of 16, uh, where Hagar, when she goes back, and uh, God promised that she would have many children, but they would be a problem in the earth. Chapter 17, verse 17, uh, there it happened. Abraham was 100 and Sarah was 90. They had a son. And they named him Isaac. The child of promise that God planned all along. Chapter 21, 1 through 3, is born. Chapter 21, Ishmael was scoffing when he was weaned, and uh, uh, he was cast out. Uh, we're going to refer to that when we get down to verse 30 here in uh, this passage. That, that verse is quoted from Genesis 21. And then chapter 22, verse 9, and following find that Isaac is off from Mount Moriah, and uh, just as he draws the knife to take Isaac's life upon the altar, and he didn't understand it all, but he, Hebrews 11 says that he believed that God could raise him from the dead, and he's going to obey God and offer his own son Isaac as a sacrifice, and when he's ready to slay him, God cries out and restrains him, and he finds a, a ram caught in the thicket and offers that as the sacrifice that God promises him. If you're in your seed, singular, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. Galatians 3.16 reference that verse. And so here's the picture. We just did a quick history of the Old Testament. We can spend hours enjoying this study. And I encourage you to back and look at these things. But that's what's being referred to here as we're in Galatians. And the Jews would have been very familiar, obviously, with those stories. And so that's where we get Ishmael and Isaac from. Let's move along then. Um, this is by way of the historical facts that we're reviewing. Let's look at the spiritual interpretation of this. The Mosaic Covenant is the law at Mount Sinai. That's where it was given to Moses. Mo Moses' is covenant. We call it the Mosaic Covenant. That's where the law was given. The Ten Commandments and all of the priestly and the tabernacle, which then became the temple. All of these things were established with Moses and the law. That was at Mount Sinai after they left Egypt. And that's what is symbolized by the bondage of the law under Hagar. He says to the Galatians, are you going back into the bondage of the law with where Hagar and Ishmael was, that earthly Jerusalem, that earthly physical literal temple in Jerusalem where you bring the sacrifices, where Ishmael is, with that law that binds. The law that binds you. Is that what you're going back under? Let's read some scripture here, verse 24 of Galatians 4. Which things are symbolic, for these are the two covenants, the one from Mount Sinai, which gives birth to bondage, which is Hagar. For this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia, and corresponds to Jerusalem, which now is, and is in bondage with her children. Just like Hagar was a slave, was in bondage, and was under the authority of Sarah. And uh, Ishmael was a wild man and, and causing trouble. And, and back, he says, it's just like Jerusalem, it's that physical, that literal, and that bondage that the law brings. Is that where you're going? Or are you going from going the spiritual, the Abrahamic covenant, the promise of Mount Moriah? The freedom that you have with Sarah, the heavenly Jerusalem, under Isaac, where Isaac was free. Let's read on some more verses. Verse 26. But the Jerusalem above is free, which is the mother of us all. For it is written, and it takes a verse, here in verse 27, it takes a verse from Isaiah 54, 1. What chapters before Isaiah 54? Isaiah chapter 53. Isaiah 53. What 
about God being barren. He says it's not just about this physical birth, but it's about the spiritual birth that comes out of Isaiah 53. Isaiah 54 talks about the millennial kingdom and the things that are that are laid out in the following chapters, the end of the book of Isaiah. Very powerful right here. He just puts right in here by inspiration of God, verse 27. For it is written, Rejoice, O you barren, you who did not bear. Break forth and shout, you who are not in labor. And the desolate has many more children than she who has a husband. What's that talking about? How can the desolate who didn't have any kids have more children than he, those that have? Paul's saying it's a spiritual message here. It's not about Hagar. It's not about all that physical descendants and that bondage. It's about Isaac and all the nations of the earth being blessed that were free. We have free Christians. These are just great and powerful verses. I know we're moving through all of this. You're like, whoa, right? If you don't got all this back in there. But this is deep and rich stuff. And we are so blessed. Springing off of Isaiah 53. <laughs> Once we have salvation, then we get the promises, the blessings. Isaiah 54. We're free. As the spiritual interpretation here is laid out in a different graph. This isn't on your paper. Maybe I should have took all that other stuff I got on your half sheet off and put this on because there's the parallels. Boom, 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 boom. Back and forth. It's all laid right out. Which side are you on, he says? Who's your mother? Hagar or Sarah? This is a personal application. Verse 28. Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are children of promise. Just like Isaac was that child of promise, so we are the children of promise. You feel like a nobody? You feel like a failure sometimes? You feel like people are against you? You feel like you're struggling with life? I'm going to tell you right here, take all of this first and drink deeply. Refresh your mind and your spirit. You are a child of promise. God has a plan for you. He loves you. He's with you. He's walking with you. You're not a nobody. You're a child of promise. You're God's child. Sit up a little straight in there in the pew, right? You're a child of God. You're not all down and out. You're not hopeless. Nothing happens to that. Get that in later. No, but we're children of God. We're not just wasting away and hopeless and defeated. You are a child of God. You're just like you and Isaac. Is that if Isaac was sitting here, you can come sit beside him. You're children of promise, just like he was. You're God's child. Oh, we went, we went to heaven. We saw Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, apostles, or the the sons of Jacob, the twelve tribes. Oh no. Mean Judah. Mean Abraham. Mean Moses. You know what? We're all humans. But you are loved by God as Noah, as Abraham, as Sarah, as Isaac. We're family of God. We can thank God. We rest in that day. We'll be encouraged in that. We minister to. That's a powerful verse. Now we brethren, as as he was, our children of promise. Praise God. We, have, we can anticipate persecution by those who are under the works religion. Verse 29 says, But as he who was born according to the flesh, then persecuted him, Isaac, right? Who was born according to the spirit, even so it is now. Is it going to be easy for you? Oh, you're just like Isaac. Isaac was picked on by Ishmael. And Isaac descendants has continued to be picked on by Ishmael and his descendants to this day. The Arabs, right? Is there an Arab Israeli conflict going on anywhere in the world? Ah, uh, you better believe it. And it goes on. So if you have trouble, part of the journey. You're in good company. Be encouraged. You're facing hard times at work. You're standing for the Lord. You young people in school standing for what's right. It's okay. You're with Isaac. You went through that. Sorry. You're going to come out on the other side, the better side. <laughs> Believers by grace are heirs of promise. Isaac wasn't. Ishmael wasn't. But Isaac was. Not Hagar, but Sarah's child. Verse 30. Nevertheless, what does the scripture say? Cast out the bondwoman and her son. The son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. We're heirs, folks. 
There's an inheritance coming. Paul's been talking about that here in Galatians. In verse 31, it says, So then, brethren, we are not children of the bondwoman, but of the free. He mentions that word free again. He praise his name, the freedom that we have. Are you, are you claiming to be free today? Part of the promise. God's promised some great things. And he's begun a good work in us and will continue that until the day of Jesus Christ. Where are you at today? Do you need to mimic Paul or Christ? Do you need to be more caring and loving or warm? Do you have a desire for your kids, some goals, some standards you want to live up to? Do you need to connect with other people to further the Lord's work? Which may be marked the box. I need to thank God for the blessings I enjoy. Thanksgiving's around the corner. Let's be ramping up our thanks. I need to see how I can help others. I need to patiently disciple others or I'll rest in and joy and stand in the freedom of Christ. Let's make some decisions today. Let's be comforted by the power of the Word of God and what we have by grace through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Would you stand with me? Let's just sing a verse and we'll get going because we're going to be moving here at the Christmas program. Let's not rush through so quickly. We don't give a chance to make a decision. And remember the word of God that's been given through this passage today. 515. Since I have been